Hello guys and uh, welcome back to the second week and uh, today we're going to cover uh, chapter two which is um, the x86 uh, microprocessor architecture so we're going to talk about um, um, the uh, architecture in general and we're going to focus um, the uh, after, after we introduce the uh, the big picture of computer architecture we're going to focus maybe on x86 its memory its mode um, it's IO and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is what we are gonna be covering today. Let me see. I think my pen works. Okay, it worked. It worked now. Okay, so we're we gonna look at the basic um, hardware um, associated with x86 um, assembly language. So um, you guys gonna learn mainly about basic uh, microcomputer design, instruction execution cycle, reading from memory and loading uh, and executing a program. So we're gonna focus on this part uh, mostly today. And then uh, we're gonna identify the 32-bit and 64-bit microprocessor modes, okay? And then we're gonna look at the basic executions uh, for x86, and then we're gonna look at the um, memory management. So we're gonna cover that today as well. And then um, the next class, we're gonna focus mainly on the uh, main components of typical x86. So we're gonna focus mainly on the motherboard and the memory. And uh, we're also gonna focus on the microprocessors in here. I mean, the microprocessor registers. And then uh, we're gonna end up by learning, which is the, uh, we're gonna learn the topic, which is the gonna be the, uh, the IO, okay? So uh, before using an assembly language, it's like C or Java or Python, you don't really care about the architecture because when you download the language, um, you have to choose that whether your operating system is Mac or, or, or Windows. And based on that, the, um, the downloader is gonna take care of which copy and then the installer is gonna figure out the configuration required by the underlying architecture. But that's not the case when you do programming with assembly. You must know your underlying architecture. So that's why we need to spend some time understanding the hardware related to x86, okay? So as I said from the beginning, just imagine or just think about using assembly language as a tool for learning about how a computer works, okay? So we know what a computer is, we know what their types, and we know their architecture. And if you forgot, please refer to uh, the big picture core, uh, uh, slides. Okay, so you should know some basic knowledge uh, about the microprocessor uh, and the system architecture before you start uh, doing assembly, and that's what we're gonna do next. So what is the basic, um, basic uh, micro uh, computer design? Right, so we know it before, right? So the architecture mainly is gonna have an IO, right? So it's gonna have the IO, it's gonna have the memory, right guys? And then it's gonna have the microprocessor, right? And then it's gonna have the buses, okay? So we're gonna look at that in more details today. So if we open the CPU, and what I mean by the CPU here, I, I'm talking about the microprocessor, okay? So this is the arithmetic logic, uh, arithmetic and logic unit. So this is the one responsible. So this is the part right here, responsible for add, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and more uh, arithmetic operations. And the logical is AND, OR, XOR, NOR, and so on and so forth. So this is gonna be the basic component. And then we have the control unit. We're gonna talk about what's the control unit. But uh, as you can see, the control unit is the one responsible for identifying the instructions and choosing whether to read or write from the memory. Okay, we're gonna cover these in more details. And we have something new, which is clock. That's not the watch we wear, but this is a clock that makes everything uh, uh, um, organized and uh, masters uh, how data and uh, instructions are fetched, decoded, and executed. So you need a clock because every uh, instruction has a certain amount of clock. So it synchronizes the CPU operations whether that's move, moving things in and out of uh, the microprocessor or uh, from the memory uh, through the microprocessor or the IO, okay? And we have something new. So now we know the control unit and then we know the clock. This is all inside the microprocessor and it's gonna be registers, 
these are things new for you. You haven't seen this before if you haven't learned any assembly language. Because if you have learned uh, C or uh, Java, you mainly focus on, or Python, you mainly focus on the main memory. So you declare variables inside this, this memory. So knowing assembly, you actually can access another memory which is inside the CPU. And this memory, unlike the, the random access memory, it has like certain amount of memory, we call them registers. Each one of them has its own name and its size, and you're gonna access them as a 32-bit, 16-bit, or an 8-bit. We're gonna cover that in more details as well. So you need to understand those components. They're very important, okay? Very, very important. So just keep that in mind. All right, guys, is that clear? Okay, and this is actually gonna be the main memory. These are the I.O. This is the random access memory, and these are gonna be the I.O. This is the data bus, this is the address bus, and this is the control bus. Remember, we have buses, microprocessor, we have memory, and we have I.O. Okay, and um, knowing that, we're gonna dive more into what is a bus in more details. So if you know, like you have certain components like the CPU, memory, and I.O., and you need to interconnect them. Okay, so you have different type of buses right here. Okay, you have address bus, data bus, and control bus. Okay, so if this is your microprocessor needs to access the memory, so have to decide where in this memory, let's say this is the part in this memory that we need to read. So this part actually has an address, 00, zero maybe, zero, 01, okay? So remember, these are four bits. This is not realistic because we know x86 is 32 bit, right? So we should, and we know like every digit, every hexadecimal uh, decimal digit represent um, four bits, correct? Okay. So this is four bit and this is four bit. This is one byte. This is two byte, maybe zero, one, zero, two. So we have one byte, two byte, three byte, four byte. So if you have four byte each by eight, then you're gonna have 32 bit, right? So the address is 32 bit. If you have a 32 bit address, then this is two to the power 32. Then you can address four billion, right? You're gonna address four billion cells in this memory. So you have to decide what the address is using the address bus, right? So that is your address bus. And then you have, to, once you decide, I wanna read the value right here, let's say it's five. Then as you notice here, the address bus is one way. So the processors determine the address bus either in the memory or in the IO. Once we decide what we need to read, then the control unit is gonna ask the control bus to decide whether to read or to write and these are two ways either you read from you, you move things from registers to memory or from memory to registers so this is going to be your data bus this is the address bus right this is going to be your data bus okay and this is going to decide hey i want to read or i want to write and that's the control bus so whatever applies to the memory applies to the io if you have a keyboard and you want to enter a data to a specific memory and then you need to communicate with the microprocessor you need those buses in there. okay so if you if you want to uh, get more details about the address bus data bus and control bus i have some details in here but i already uh, explained them in more detail so this is mainly the binary signals right it's synchronized actions it's going to say read or write that is mainly what it is Okay, so now we're gonna go back. That is the box. Remember when we looked at the microprocessor, this is my microprocessor. We have registers in the top, right? And then uh, we have the ALU. We're gonna cover the ALU through assembly language. And then we are gonna have the control unit. And then we're gonna have the clock, right? So these are very important units. So now we are focusing on the clock. So what is the clock? So it's a timing signal, right? So this is like a signal as you can see it right here. All right, so this part represents zero, and then now you are increasing the voltage. So you have a voltage in here, and this voltage right now is becoming one. Okay, it's gonna be one. During this time, you can do an operation. And then now it's going back to zero. Okay, and then zero, zero, zero. So this is what we call a cycle. Okay, so from here to here is a cycle. Or you can consider it from here, to there is a cycle. Okay, so this is zero, and now it is one, and it's gonna go back now to zero, right? So this is a cycle. 
from here to here is a cycle from zero to one and then now it's going to come back to zero and then start another cycle so this is another cycle and then come back to zero and then now it's going to go again so this is another cycle you see it so this is one cycle second the first cycle the second cycle the third cycle okay so you know this is what you call zero one zero one zero one you see it so this is going to be the cycles and this is what's going to synchronize all the cbu operations process operation read or write or whatever that operation is okay so the cbu designed in a way or the microprocessor designed in a way that is going to do something a specific thing within this time so it's like the maestro right it's like you're trying certain you're trying to make certain thing work 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 with um a specific work within a specific time okay so this is actually what we call the frequency so the frequency is the number of cycles so if you want to see the speed of the computer you want to know how this microprocessor or how many uh cycles that this microprocessor can produce so this is one cycle one and this is second cycle and so on and so forth so this is what we call frequency and within a specific time you can produce a number of cycles and that's going to determine the frequency okay so the frequency is measured in terms of number of cycles so what produced the frequency what produces the frequency this is what we call crystal so it's like the uh this crystal is going to produce a number of uh, cycles per second and that is the secret like intel arm that is the crystal It's a special material that uh based on this material a secret and that choosing the the specific material you're going to be able to produce um a certain amount of cycles and then maybe you're going to have a beam from here and then when the beam is going to go out of this material is going to produce the electrical cycles okay so this is what the frequency is okay so this frequency when you go and you buy a computer they always going to tell you back in the days megahertz or nowadays gigahertz when they say giga megahertz they can be are telling you that within a second the microprocessor will produce a million a one million cycle you see one million cycle in one second you might think this is really huge but it's nothing because uh, nowadays we are trying to compute very complex uh, phenomena in the real world so that's not even enough okay i'm gonna explain that in more details when it's a gigahertz that means that's the frequency so that means this microprocessor is going to produce one billion cycles sorry one billion cycles within a second okay so this is per second all right so that's going to tell you how fast a microprocessor is okay so the the clock cycle actually the clock defines the speed okay at which the systems actually operates so let's take, look at a real example so we have x86 which is pentium right here and it takes three clock cycles to transfer data from memory to location uh, uh, inside the x86 uh, microprocessor so this is the memory you have a data in here and you want to transfer this inside a microprocessor and we know what's inside a microprocessor the memory inside the microprocessor this is register one and x86 maybe this is eax so we want to transfer data from memory to microprocessor okay so if you want to do that then um this is says right here it takes three clock cycle so if you want to take this to this you have to have one two three cycles right so now we want to know that in terms of time so let's look at the equation that we have right here so we want to know the clock period right this is you can look at this from here to here as a what guys as a time right period of time you with me so this is a time that spins that takes the signals to go from here to that part okay so if you want to get the clock period which is the time you're just going to have one and divided by what the clock frequency what is the clock frequency are you working at a 10 okay let's sorry at a million frequency 10 to the power 6 or 10 to the power 9 so which one all right so if that is the case if it's one uh, gigahertz so we know it's one to the power 10 to the power 9 right 
if we do this map right here, we're gonna get one nanosecond. So the period, if that is your clock frequency, right? And if that is the case, now if it takes three clock cycles, we know with one, it's gonna take one nano. So that is one nano, not a whole second, right? This is all produced by uh, per second. But when you do this here, per one, it's gonna give you one nanosecond within one nanosecond. So if you do this, then it's gonna take you three nanoseconds to move five to the register. So it's, it's even less than the blinking your eye, right? So uh, this is very important. So the machine clock cycle measures the time of a single operation. So this is an operation which is what? Transfer, okay, move this to this. It's gonna take you three nanoseconds. So that all goes back to the clock. So the clock as a concept is very important. You need to understand it, very, very important, okay? So a machine instruction requires one clock cycle to execute, okay, some of them, all right? Few maybe requires 50 clocks. So it depends on the type of instruction. This is move, this is add, this is maybe increment, this is maybe shift to the right. These are different instruction and every instruction has its own what? Clock cycle, okay? So it has its own period of time that it takes it to be executed, okay? And uh, if you look at this part right here, this is what the CPU is, the microprocessor, okay? This is the main uh, memory right here, random access memory, and this is the memory controller. So microprocessor is made out of material that is really very hard to communicate directly with random access memory. Why is that? I will explain that in a minute. This random access memory works at specific frequency. And the microprocessor here works at specific frequency. Frequency here and there, they are completely different. This is very fast here, okay? And here it is slower, when I say slower, compared to the CPU. So the CPU is gonna waste some time right here. So that's what we call waste state because of the empty clock cycle right here. When the CPU requests something from the memory, this memory works at a very slow or a very low frequency, right? So that is gonna delay. So the CPU now is gonna communicate with the memory controller, does not communicate directly with the memory, and you're gonna say, hey, I need to read a specific amount or a spe specific uh, memory address in, within this chip, within this cell. So the microcontroller is, works almost at the same speed with the microprocessor and understand the speed that the memory is working at. So if we wanna read this pipe right here, we wanna move this pipe inside here, right? So that's gonna take us time. This is what we will, we're gonna call the empty cycle. So the CPU says, I want to read, okay? So let me write, let me draw it right here. I want one, two, I want to read. So this, it's sending the signal that I want to read. So it's send it to the memory, then the memory says, okay, I got it, the memory controller. I send it to the memory. The memory is gonna say, I'm searching for it. I'm searching for it. I'm searching for it. There you go, I find it. Give it to the microcontroller and I'm done. So this time right here, this is what we call the empty clock cycle or the wait state. So the CPU was waiting, idle, doing nothing right here. Until this point, when this says the microcontroller, memory controller is gonna say, hey, we find what you really want. Then it's gonna take it and then it's gonna work on it from there onward. You see what I'm talking about? So this is very important. So this is what the empty cycle is, okay? So some instructions, if they actually needs to read something like move from the memory, if they move things from the memory to the microprocessor, it's gonna take time. And the reason if I ask you why, you know that the frequency, okay? So the memory speed, just say the speed, that's enough for me, okay? The memory, either the memory is slower than the CPU, or the CPU frequency is higher than the memory, either way, okay? So this is what we call the wait state, or we call the empty clock cycle. All right, so now we know uh, the CPU and we know the clock cycle. That is very important. Now we're gonna, very, very important. We're gonna look at the um, instruction cycle. 
So we know what the cycle is right now. So that's clear. We know what a cycle. This is a one cycle. Okay, this is another cycle. So we know a cycle. And we know each instruction, it is going to take a specific amount of, or a number, a specific amount, or a specific number of cycles. Right? So now we want to know the instruction cycle. So microprocessor or, uh, has plenty of instructions in there. Okay, this is actually made um, to do specific things, right? Like move, add, subtract, and so on and so forth. So we want to know how the CPU um, execute those instructions. So we know everything happens within a specific amount of cycles, right? Okay, so that's what we before talked about. We said instruction set. So we have many instructions, and we have actually more than 20,000. Okay, maybe have a million instruction. Okay. So these instructions could be for transferring data, like move, push, and pop, or we're gonna cover those. Or it could be arithmetic, like add or subtract. Or it could be bit manipulation, that's logical. This is arithmetic, this is logical, like and, or, and XOR. Or it could be program execution transfer, like jump, we're gonna use it, like call, we're gonna use it, like return, we're gonna use them, so these are different instructions and string instructions we are not going to cover those but these are also instructions that they have a specific uh, instruction cycle and we have the processor control instructions which is like set set a flag or clear a flag or wait and so on and so forth so we have different type of instructions and each one of them or they're going to have a specific amount of um they're going to take a specific uh, amount of cycles and we will learn what is the instruction execution cycle. Okay, so if I ask you this question, you need to understand that. Before we do it, we have to look, now we know the cycle, we know the different type of instructions, we have to look at the format. Okay, so what, we, what I mean by the format is this. So if you have an instruction like add, and we say the operation code, it only has the operation code, so that operation code may be 10001. So of the CBU, identify this instructions by reading it in this way it says hey now i know this is add maybe this is one one zero 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 one maybe this is sub so this is the code that identifies instructions so for this instruction just say add but usually add is a binary operation right guys when you say one plus two so when you say add you have to give me two operands do you have operands right here no where are they ALU doesn't really care for this computer, it seems. It says, okay, I will go to a specific place, I will find one and two, and then I will add them. So when you create this instruction, it's very small, it's very fast, it's not gonna take a lot of cycles, right? Because it only have the operation code, it doesn't have operands. This one has operands, has one operation and one operand. So it seems like you're gonna say one plus, and the arithmetic unit will figure out where two is. So all you need to give it is just uh, one, okay? So this is what it is. You're gonna say add A. Add A to what? Add one to what? So whoever designed this instructions made it clear that the add will know where B is if you're adding A to B or one to two. So these are different format, okay? This is a very complex instruction. So it has the operation code that's gonna tell you whether is it arithmetic, logical, string, and so on and so forth. And it has one and two right here. Here it only have one, it would figure out two. Here it has neither, okay? So this is very important and um, uh, to know, and uh, you know that that add right here is gonna say add register to register, R1 maybe to R0 or R0 to R1. We're gonna talk about this in more details, all right? And this is another complex instruction that's gonna, maybe is gonna take more time. This is adding this to this maybe, and then maybe moving the result back right here. So we have the operation code, operand one, operand two, and operand three. So the bottom line, what I'm trying to explain right here, guys, like instructions are different when it comes to format, okay? In addition to the purpose, right? This is just arithmetic. Maybe it's gonna be logical. Maybe it's gonna be moving or transferring. Maybe we don't know, but the operands play a very important role, okay? We have a very important, um, they play a very important uh, uh, roles right here. So we have to understand the formats. Is that clear, guys? So these are the instruction formats.
Okay, so an operand can be, this operand can be what? Register, okay, or it could be memory, like this one, this is memory, A, okay. Or it could be a register, like R0 or R1, or it could be immediate. We, maybe we're gonna say add, like this example here, we're gonna say add to R05, right? So this is immediate, right? So um, these things are gonna vary depending on what you're doing, whether things are in the memory, whether things are on the registers, or whether they are given as an immediate. So you need to know those operands, they could be either of those three types, okay? And keep in mind that what we covered right now, this is the sequential. So during this cycle, this is one cycle, right? That's what we call it the cycle. That is the cycle. So this is zero, it means nothing, and this is zero, okay? So this is a cycle, this is a cycle. So inside this cycle, you can actually fetch, decode, and execute. So that's the instruction execution cycle. So this is execution cycle. So if I ask you, what is the instruction execution cycle, execution cycle, this is what I'm talking about. So if we have this instruction add to EAX, which is a, a register, fine. So before the CPU can do anything, it has first to fetch this instruction. And look at what? That's a format, right? Operation code. What is it? Add, mull, subtract, transfer. What is it? Okay, so this is gonna first fetch, okay? And then decode. The decoder is gonna look at the type of uh, the top, the, it's gonna look at the operation code. It's gonna look at the code for this operation. And then, then it's gonna identify. Why we say fetch? We know that your code, when you write a program, you have dot .code memory, right? Right, guys? So inside this memory, you have the dot .code. And you also have what dot data. That's when you declare your variables. So that is the main memory, right? So if you have this instruction, the one right here, it's gonna be inside the executable file and the executable file is gonna be inside this dot code. And this is outside of the microprocessor or let me call it the CPU. So try not to confuse yourself with the other CPU. So before the CPU does anything or do anything, it has first to go to the memory and fetch. Once it fetches, okay, now I have it within house, then I have to do what? I have to decode it to understand the operation code. And based on the operation code, we will know what type of uh, instruction it is. Once that's the case, then we're gonna execute it. We will see this is the basic execution cycle. So this is for the first instruction. And if we have another instruction, the program usually has many instructions, right? It could have no instructions, it could have only one. It depends, but I, was, I would assume a meaningful program, it has at least a um, couple of instructions, right? So let's say you're gonna say subtract from EBX, let's say six, okay? So we're gonna go and fetch the next instruction, decode it, execute it, and so on and so forth. So one instruction at a time, and this is what you call what? Sequential time, all right? So you can do things differently using uh, parallel, okay? And we can actually use something we call pipeline. So when you move from fetch and you start decoding, so this is fetching, you finish fetching add and you start decoding, then now this part is idle, right? If this part idle, we're gonna use this time to fetch the next instruction. So now we are fetching the next instruction. Okay, so this is instruction one, and this is instruction two. And then when you go and you finish with the decoding you are executing, we're gonna move this one right now, it's idle, right? And we're gonna move the instruction two to the decoders, and then maybe you're gonna take instruction three, fetch, and so on and so forth. So this is what we call pipelining. And that was the first concept of uh, parallel programming back in the days. One microprocessor, but do things in parallel. Okay, so once you divide the CPU time into fetch, decode, execute, and once you're done with the fetch, you do the decoding, then the fetch unit is, is available now, then we're gonna use it instead of waiting or wasting the time, we're gonna use it to fetch the next instruction and so on and so forth. So you might wonder why nowadays we have multi-course if pipeline actually works, but pipelines actually hits a point where it's gonna say you cannot divide the, the uh, divide the frequency more than you can do. 
Okay, so that's when we thought, okay, this is the best we can do with the pipeline. So we need another core because we still need uh, more speed. Okay, guys, so this is very, uh, very important for you to understand. This is like fundamental things, okay? So that is the whole idea of the machine cycle. So you have the control unit. This is going to be the one. Remember when we talked about the ALU and we talked about the control unit. So the control unit is going to be responsible for fetch the instruction from the memory. Okay? So that is the control unit. Okay? And step two is going to decode. So the control unit, we know the clock cycle as well, right? We have the clock. Okay? So the control unit is going to go to the memory, as I explained right now, it's going to fetch, and then it's going to decode. Okay? Once it decodes, it say, okay, now I know it's an add. It is the responsibility of ALU to, to, do, uh, to execute the addition, because that's part of arithmetic, right? The first thing. Once it's going to execute, if we need to store the data back in memory, the step, the step four is going to store the result back in the memory. So this is the symbol, fetch, decode, execute. And this part right here is going to be the complete fetch, decode, fetch, execute, and store. It doesn't have this. This is optional. As, you, as you're going to see, the second fetch is optional. And then um, the store is optional. But these are not optional. Fetch, decode, and execute, they're going to be always there. OK? So what, what controls that is something that I'll explain in a second, OK? Let me see what I have in here. So I, do I have a space back in here? So let me say, if I say add to EAX1, and here add to memory one, sorry, add to EAX memory one. And then here I would say add to memory one EAX. You with me, guys? This is very important. So we're going to learn now what is the instruction cycle. So this is something already in the memory, right, guys? In the main memory. So first thing we have to do, what? Always, all these instructions, they first must have what? Fetch. You with me? Let me see if I can erase that. Where is the eraser? OK. OK. So go back and get the pen, OK? So fetch is required always, because this is your memory, and your memory is divided at least into dot .code and dot .data, OK? So dot .code is the whole thing is a code, OK? So add to EAX what? One. So the whole thing is in the memory. Just fetch it, and then what? Decode it to identify what it is, OK? So once we fetch this, then we decode. So we fetch and we decode all the time. It doesn't matter. These are must be there. And then now the operands type is going to play a rule right here. OK? So the, the role right here, if we're going to say, do we have a memory? Do you have a variables right here? No, this is immediate. Immediate is part of the instruction. So do we need to go to the memory and fetch something? No. Then we are ready. Execute. This is done. OK? How about this? Do we have a memory here? Yes. So when we fetch this and we decoded it, M1 is the address. Keep that in mind. So M1 points at 5. So we are not interested in M1. We are interested in 5. But all we know at this point is where 5 is. So now we have to go and fetch 5. OK, do you have everything in place? Yes, then now we're going to do what? We're going to execute. All right, so this is where the execution is. Is the destination a memory? No, it's a register, so we're done. OK, so right here, we already fetch and decode this instruction. We always have to do fetch decode with your eyes closed. You have to do it all the time, no matter what type of operands you have in the instruction. So do we have a memory? Yes, that is a memory. So we have to go and fetch it. So that's fetch a memory. OK, because M1 is just the address. OK, it's not the value. OK, so when if, if you invite me to, if someone invited me to visit them, I mean to visit him or her, then what I'm going to say, 
what is the address? Am I interested in the address? No, I'm interested to come and visit you. But without the address, it's not possible to access or to reach up with you. I mean, to, to catch up with you, right, guys? So we need the address right here to access the value. Is that, is, is that clear, guys? Okay. So we fetch the code and we have a memory again, a fetch. Now we are ready to what? Execute. Is the destination a memory? Yes. Then we have to go back and update it. So we're going to say what? Store. Why is that? So let's say this is five. You fetch five. So this is inside the CPU. And imagine you have a one in here. So when you do this inside the CPU, that is the CPU, the one at the top, two parts of the CPU. Now M1 is what? Is six. If M1 is six, the CPU has to go back right here and update it. So instead of five now, it's going to say this is now what? Six. So that's why we need to go back and update it. Here, we did not update the memory because we used it as what? A value that we are adding to. So we are adding this to this. So this is the destination. This is the one that's going to be affected. Here, the destination happens to be what? To be memory. That's why we need to go back and update that address from five, six. Right here, the destination is a register. If the de destination, if a destination is a register, we don't need to updated it, right? It's going to be automatic. It doesn't require an extra, requires a, an extra cycle. Okay, guys, is that clear? So we are done. So the bottom line, fetch, decode, execute, if no memory. Okay? If you have, if this is no memory. If you have memory and the memory no, not destination, then fetch, decode, fetch execute okay and this is one and this is two number three if you have what if you have memory and the memory is destination then fetch decode fetch execute and update the memory i hope that um make more sense to you right now guys okay so let me go to the slide and give you and this exercise so let's go, go and look at this exercise what would we say Increment uh, M1. Increment is an instruction, so we're going to fetch and we're going to decode it. We know this blindly. Do I have a memory? Yes, then go and fetch it. Okay, and then now we are ready to execute. Is the destination memory? Yes, this is a source on the destination, so we're going to say store it. Okay, what if we're going to say add to M1 5? So again, we're gonna do fetch and decode. So this is for this, right? And this is for this. So you're gonna say fetch, decode. Do we have memory? Yes, fetch. Okay, and then now once we fetch, we execute. Is the memory destination? Yes. Then now we're gonna go and do what? To store. How about sub? Track from, from let's say EBX, which is a resistor M1. So again, we're gonna come here, fetch decode blindly. So you got to have of your half of the points. And then we're gonna say, do we have a memory? Yes. So then fetch it. So what you have is the address. Go and fetch the value. Okay. So we get the fetch now. We get the value inside. Then we're gonna execute. Is the destination a memory? No, it's a register. So we're done. You see what I'm talking about, guys? Okay. So how to read from a memory, that is very, uh, very important as well. So we need to understand the memory. So are we clear right now? So we talked about um, right here, we talked about what's ALU, what is control unit, that's fetch and decode. And we talked about the clock cycle. So every instruction is gonna have its own cycle. And we already a little bit talked about registers like EAX, EBX, and so on. And we talked about memory because that affects, right? The memory, when we go and read things from the memory, we have something we call the empty cycle, right? Or the clock cycle, right? The empty clock cycle. When we move things from memory to register or from registers, uh, from memory to CPU or from CPU back to the memory, okay? So this is very important, but we need to understand if this is a memory, this is a memory unit, a cell inside the memory. So every cell has an address, it has a control bus, which is read or write, and it has the data, which is moving things into the memory or out of the memory. Okay, so this is very important to understand. So every cell inside the memory, inside this memory, is going to have this architecture. 
okay? So if you want to look at the right operation, it requires specification of the data. What do I mean by the specification? Can you think about it? So if you want to write something right here, you have to tell me the specification. So what is the specification? So now we know the memory is a space. You can divide this space into in, 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 in any way you want. Okay. So let's say if I say A is a memory, and this is my dot data, and I say A is a byte, and I'm storing five. And maybe I'm gonna say B is a word. This is something new for you because for you you know how to say integer A in Java. So integer is a specification. What do you mean integer is a type? No, it's a specification at a time. So it is sign integer, we know that now, right? And the size here is 32 bits, so that means four bytes. So when you wanna write something in the memory, you have to tell me what A is. So that's why if you, if you use A in your program without declaring it, you're gonna get an error because we need to write to the memory and the memory has to know what space I have like, 64 bit or I can go 128, you tell me what space you want. So when you say integer A, we are saying four bytes. Four bytes means what guys? 52 bits. Okay, so if you're gonna have this byte and then this byte and then this byte and then this byte, this each of eight bits. Okay, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and this is so on and so forth. Okay, so four by eight is gonna be 32 bit. So if you want to do that, then you have to determine the specification. The specification must be there. Okay, so this is actually what's going to be uh, reading from a memory. So if you want to read from the memory, read that doesn't really require a specification, just because the specification is already being determined by the write, right? So someone has already taken care of that. But what you need to do first, you need to place the address, right? What is it in this memory that you need to read? Maybe the cell, we need to read five. Maybe that's A, okay? We place the address, which is A, and then we assert. We're gonna say we wanna read or write, so the assert right here is what? Read. And then we wanna wait. Why are we waiting? Because we know the empty cycle, remember? Remember the shape? This is the empty cycle. So the CPU is gonna wait because the signal is gonna go to the memory controller and the memory controller is gonna go to the random access memory and is gonna go back this way. Okay, so if that is the case, then we need to wait, all right? So we're gonna wait for a clock cycle, okay, for the chip to respond, and then now we're gonna copy the data. It says, yeah, I'm, I got it, I got what you really want, so that's how the CPU is gonna communicate, and then it's gonna wait, 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 until the memory says I'm ready. If it's ready, it's gonna say load it to the data bus, and from the data bus, now it's gonna go back to the CPU, and maybe this is gonna be, it's gonna go to EAX register inside the CPU. Is that clear, guys? Okay, so this is gonna be the right cycle. Right cycle, again, is gonna what? Place the address, right? So we have to say where is in the memory and what is the specification of this? And then we're gonna place the data. You see, it's different from the read, right? And the read, you place and then you assert. Here, you place the address and then you place the data. You're gonna say, I wanna store five in here. Okay, and then you're gonna assert. So the assertion right here is gonna be writing. And then now you're gonna wait because again, the memory is gonna take some time, right? To respond to the microprocessor or to the CPU. Okay, and then after some time, the pipe is gonna go right there. So this is the memory cycle, okay? So if I wanna show you a random access memory, real random access memory, this is how it looks like. So inside this, you have the content and right here you have the address. So if looking at this, Content, can you tell me what is the size of this cell? The hint is in the hexadecimal. These are hexadecimal numbers. So we know F means what? One, 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 one. That's four bits. Every digit is a four bit, right? The other F is gonna be one, 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 one. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. This is eight bits. You with me, guys? And this is gonna equal to one byte, right? So this is a byte. This is zero, zero in hexadecimal. This is a byte. This is five, so five means zero, one, zero, one. That's five, if you remember, one, two, four, eight. This is one plus four, it's gonna be what? It's gonna be five. This is again, we say it's 15, because this is one, two, four, eight. 
8, 2, 4, because all of them is active, right? Are active, right? So it's going to be 8, 12, 14, 15. You see? And 7 is going to be what? 0, 1, 1, 1. So this is 1, 2, 4, 8. So 4 plus 2 plus 1 is 7. So this is 7 and this is 5. So this is 8 bits, which, eight bits, which, which means what? 1 byte. So this is the address that acts as a byte. So the computer goes in terms of what? Bytes. Every byte has an address. OK? So you might wonder if I have 32 bit, that means I have four bytes together. Am I going to have four addresses? OK, or four addresses? In fact, you have only one address. That's it. These are there, but they are not useful. I will explain that in more details later. OK, so uh, with that, we're going to look at something which is we call uh, cache memory. And the cache memory is very important as well. It's a very important concept. So um, if you look at the cache memory, why we need a cache memory? Now you know it, guys, right? Every time the microprocessor goes to the main memory, right, it's going to waste a time. So if you want to go to the main memory, do not only bring A, bring as, as many as you can. So that way you're going to have one trip outside. You're going to waste time only once. Like when you go and do shopping, okay, instead of going to multiple uh, stores, you just go to maybe Target or Walmart and you're going to find everything you want, almost everything in there. So one trip, you're going to get food, you're going to get drink, you're going to get like maybe even clothes, sports material, whatever. Okay, so you're going to go to one store and you're going to come back home. So that's going to save you a lot of time, right? Microprocessor works in this way. But in order to go and bring as many things as from outside, it has to have similar memory but inside the CPU, not the registers, but similar to the random access memory inside the CPU. This is what you call the cache memory. So that's to reduce the time of going outside. So every CPU, if you see, this is a chip CPU, it has a cache memory here. The CPU right here, do you see it? It has a cache memory. This is multi-core, core one and core two. It has its own internal memory that's within the chip in addition to the memory outside. So when you go there for this memory, when you go to this memory, you can take up to 256 kilobytes. So go and get 250 kilobytes at once, even if you only need to read A. So in the future, if you want to read B, you don't need to go outside. You already have it in the cache. So the CPU is going to access it really fast. Okay. So to solve the problem of wasting the empty cycle, they came up with the idea of the cache. So these are different type of caches, old cache nowadays. Maybe you have, you are not going to have the chance to see this is no longer in the market, but this is used to be the cache memory. And then they moved it inside the CPU. That's what they call level one. Okay. And level two. There's also another very important concept, which is um, hit and miss. Okay, so head means, so since data moves inside the cache memory all the time, which is this is inside microprocessor, it moves in and out with the help of the OS. So the operating system sometimes and the microprocessor, they have disagreements. The microprocessor believe five still here, but the operating system sees that we need to get swap things in and out. Maybe they're gonna get five out and replace it with six, with, 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 the, with six without um, informing the microprocessor in time. It's about to inform it, but in time. By the time the microprocessor says, I need five, the operating system is about to tell it like, okay, I already changed it five into six. That's what we call cache what? Cache miss. Okay, so this is something that they use to measure the quality of the cache memory. You should have as minimum as uh, possible in terms of cache misses. Cache head means you find what you really want, okay? So we can go back now to the basic idea of how program run, right? So now we know that the program is actually first, you edit it, you assemble it, you link it, then you have your executable. Once you have your executable, that your executable actually is still in the hard disk mode. If you wanna execute it, you go and you click on the executable. When you click on the executable, you are loading it from the hard disk to the random access memory, where? On the dot .code. And if your program has a data on it, the loader is gonna create the dot .data. And if it uses local variables, we're gonna talk about them, is gonna create the dot .stack. And if it uses objects, is gonna create uh, the dot .heap. Okay, so your program, this is actually your executable, a map. We're gonna talk about this in more details later on the class. 
Okay, so the operating system is going to point at the entry point. So in the dot code, the first instruction, let's say you have add to EAX1 and then sub from EAX5, and then you're going to say increment AL, and you're going to say mul BL. So the first instru instruction in your program, this is what we call the entry point. And the entry point is always going to come right after the main. That's why you cannot write a program in any language without writing a main. So you have to have the main function. So the main function helps the loader, okay, and the microprocessor to know where is the first instruction within this program. Okay, so the first instruction comes right after the main. So the main is something very important, is a program. The main is a program that actually works with the loader or is part of the loader. So once you do that, then the CPU is going to do what? Now we know how the program is executed, right? Fetch, decode, execute, if no memory. Or fetch, decode, fetch, execute, if there is a memory and the memory is not a destination. Or fetch, decode, fetch, execute, and what? Store, if the destination is a memory. Okay? But first we have to load the executable. Before we load it, we have to translate it, right? The program that uh, trying to solve a real problem, assemble it, link it, and get the executable, and so on and so forth. Okay, guys? So that's a real example right here. Let me just see if I can erase this part. I don't want you to get confused. So this is like a real example right here. So if you look at this example, Right here, you will see like this is the CPU, and this is the RAM, the random access memory. Let me do this. And these are the instruction I was talking about. So, so this is a real example. All right, so this is your Firefox. It's already in the storage in the hard disk. You have to load it to the memory, <clears throat> excuse me. And then the CPU now needs to start running those instructions once at a time. So this is number one, copy the instruction to the RAM. Random access memory, that's what the loader is going to do. Okay, that's what the loader is going to do. Once we identify the entry points address of the first instruction, the CPU is going to do these, right? Fetch, decode, execute, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now we're going to just look at the mode of operation. So when you execute, um, when you start your computer, there are different modes and there is a default mode. So this is the default mode, protected mode. Okay, so protected mode is recently microprocessors realized the importance of security, so they run with the protected mode. Do you want to change the protected mode to real address mode or system management mode or virtual uh, x86, uh, 8086 mode? You can do that. Okay, but what we're going to focus on in this class is the protected mode. So in the protected mode, the whole idea is that back in the days when we were using the real address mode, things are really mixed up. So your program can reference another program's memory. That used to be okay because we do not have any problem because we assume that users are, are not malicious. But nowadays people are misusing uh, vulnerability or vulnerabilities or weaknesses in the, um, on the architecture. So this is one of them. So in order to prevent that from happening, we have to protect uh, the memory and the microprocessor. So there are some security procedures that are going to be executed. Um, uh, uh, so, so data is going to be protected and in instructions as well. Okay. So this is the basic uh, execution environment. But before we go there, I just want to show you that if you have a protected mode, then you can access a space of four gigabyte. Why? Because this is two to the power 32. Remember, it's going to be four gigabyte space. Okay, if you are in the real address mode, that's another mode, then you're going to have 20 bits. Okay, so 2 to the 20 is going to give you one mega space. So protected mode not only adds security, but it gives more space in terms of memory. And that's what we call paging. So when you take the operating system class, you will know more about um, memory management. And you will know about protected mode, real address mode, and so on and so forth. If you look at this memory, this is a real memory. I just want you to feel it. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is a byte. And every byte has an address. 
So if this memory, which is unrealistic, back in the days it used to be realistic, but not, not, not today. So if you have four address bus, this is address bus. If you have four address bus, then you can access memory of what? 16 word memory, count them from here to there, they're gonna be 16, why? Two to the power four, it's gonna give you 16. So if I can say zero, zero right here, zero, 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 that is my address for this byte. Zero, 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 one for this byte. Zero, zero, one, zero for this byte, and so on, until I get here, it's gonna be one, 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 that's 15, right? So zero to 15 is 16 words. So you can store 16 bytes within this memory. If you wanna access this address, that, that's how the computer works, so what this number is, so suppose this number is 1001, so this is 1, 2, 4, 8. So this is 8 plus 2, 10. 10 plus 1, 11. So if you go to here, that is 11. So that is what you are trying to read, this memory, this byte. You place this one to the address pass, and this is what we call what? Decoder. And then the decoder is going to decode this address pass and is going to determine this memory, which is going to be 1011. Okay, this is 11, right? This is gonna be 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You see, so this is 11. If you wanna read nine this is or eight, this is gonna be eight. This is gonna be one, zero, zero, one. Sorry, one, zero, zero, zero. Okay, and if you wanna read the one after it right here, it's gonna be one, zero, zero, one, that's nine. And this is gonna be one, zero, one, zero, which is 10 and so on and so forth. You place it here in the address bus and the decoder is gonna decode this and it's gonna, get you the data inside here. Let's say you have uh, you have 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. You're storing 15 in this cell. And in, in, in address 11, you're storing 15. So you need to go and fetch the 15 because 1, 0, 1, 1 is just the address. Okay, guys, if I give you uh, a 32-bit address, you were able to to space, to have a space of four gigabyte. Here I only gave you four. You were able to, uh, to address or to have addressable memory of size, what, 16 words. But if I give you 32 bit, that's gonna be more than four, 32 bits in here, you're gonna address a four gigabyte space. If I give you just 20 bits instead of four, you're gonna have more space. So that is how it works, guys. Thought of adding this slide, so you're gonna see what we are talking about, okay? So this is gonna be now, we know what the memory is, we know, we know the clock, we know the memory, we know the registers, okay, we know the ALU, now we need to, uh, sorry, we know the ALU, we know the control unit, and now we're gonna focus on registers, okay? So these are the general purpose registers, I'm gonna talk about them in the, uh, in the next class, but hopefully by now, you, um, you understand the big picture of uh, the architecture. All right, so um, I will uh, stop right here and then uh, we're gonna continue on the rest of those uh, on the next class, okay? Uh, so thank you very much, guys. We'll uh, see you during the office hours in case if you have questions. Thank you.